Cool, so here we go. Hi everybody, hope you are all well. My name is John Maffioli and I'm really excited to be the host today of our, of our live lounge. Right, so we've had some really, really great speakers over the past few weeks and months. Wow, it feels, feels like a long time since lockdown began, hasn't it? And it's pretty exciting that all of a sudden things are now going to start to ease and the new norm, as everyone says all the time, is now going to start to reveal itself. But today is really interesting in terms of the speaker that we have. As you know, Hub CP is all about bringing like-minded entrepreneurs together, people with great big ambition, people with huge dreams. And by bringing those people together, what we want to do is inspire everybody that listens and hears and interacts with the entrepreneurs that we get as guest speakers. Um, but we love to celebrate. We love to celebrate the greatness of these incredible people. And Rob Law is our, is our, is our speaker today. Now, Rob Law founded the uh, Trunky, and I'm sure you will have seen in airports all around the world on holiday, in loads of places, those wheel, wheel on luggage whereby the kids are always being towed around uh, by, by their parents. They are a product that so many of us have, have seen. And what's really interesting today is Rob's story and all the challenges, like so many great entrepreneurs, Rob has overcome. And so hopefully today, the point of today is going to really be around that inspiration, especially as we navigate these times that we are going to be in for maybe some time yet. So without any further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Rob Law to the Live Lounge. Hi, there John. Thanks for, hey, thanks for how are you? Yeah, it's a little bit toasty here, but uh, yeah, the trunkies are raring to go to visit grandma over the coming yeah. weeks. Awesome. And right on cue, you've got one right in the background, Rob. We would, we would expect nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Rob. The first thing I want to talk about before I just touch upon the Dragon's Den, because obviously that is something that many people may have seen, and especially in, in, in the terms of what that has actually created for your career, from the setback of that to creating a multi-million turnover business with your products in over 100 countries, 50 distributors. It's mind-blowing what you've, what you've created. But you've recently gone and launched a book, uh, 65 Roses and a Trunky, Defying the Odds in Life and business what was the thinking sorry rob 65 roses 65 roses 65 roses <clears throat> in a trunk can you explain what the 65 roses means yeah so 65 roses is what a lot of children refer to the genetic inherited disease called cystic fibrosis and that is the, uh, a personal battle i've been fighting my entire life as i was born with that condition too so i get asked to do a lot of business speaking give keynotes talk to management teams and I normally just tell the business story. And at the end of all those events, people always say, oh, you should write a story about your business challenges and how you've overcome them. And then a few years ago, I started thinking, well, actually, if I talk, decide to tell my personal story that I've kept very private up until now, uh, maybe it will inspire some more people to uh, overcome their challenges, beat their demons. And uh, yeah, we, we might have quite a business book on our hands. So. Brilliant. Yeah, well, absolutely. we're going to be talking about a lot of the uh, things that I'm sure you'll have mentioned in the book. Just going to the Dragon's Den, I remember watching it. And when I think about what you went through on that program and the, the, the buckle broke, but then you had a dragon describing your company as worthless. And therefore, it really is. I'm just really proud, really happy to have you on this on this program today because that must have been one hell of a setback, one hell of a setback. But we're going to come to that in a bit. What I want to ask you is, what was the idea? What was the light bulb moment for the, uh, the luggage that you created, the business that you created? Yeah, so it all goes back to 1997, um, many, many years ago, and I was studying product design at the University of Northumbria. It was the best class or the best school to go to at the time. Jonathan Ives of Apple fame had been through that course a few years earlier. And I was a bright eyed, bushy tailed 19 year old product design student. And in my second year, we were all asked to enter a national luggage design competition. So I went off down to um, Phoenix and Eldon Square, if anyone's familiar with Newcastle, uh, looking for inspiration. And I was there in the adult luggage section, trying to do a bit of market research, see what the trends were. And I noted hard molded plastic suitcases were quite fashionable from the likes of Carlton and Samsonite. 
Um, but it was all black and boring and I, I kind of drifted off into the kids' toy section and I guess I'm a big kid at heart. And I remember stood looking at the ride on toys and reminiscing how my younger brother used to drive his ride on tracks around the garden relentlessly. <clears throat> but the manufacturing technology used to make them wastes a lot of the internal space. So I thought, well, actually, I've traveled a bit. I know kids get bored in the airport. Why not marry that adult technology of manufacturing technology with a ride on toy and create a really functional piece of luggage that's sculpted and ergonomic and characterful for a child to, to ride around. And the idea of Trunky, although it was called Rodeo back in the day, was born. Now, the judges took me aside and said, I I've won the competition. And the judges told me, you know, you've got quite a commercial idea here. You should try and license it. So I approached Carlton, who were manufacturing down in Croydon back in two, before the 2000s and uh, really excited. My first business opportunity had a prototype, my mood boards, my market research. We're going to revolutionize family travel together. What do you think? And they told me they were in the luggage business and I'd invented a toy. So uh, I left empty handed from that experience, phoned up a couple of toy companies, had several meetings, and uh, they politely told me I'd invented a piece of luggage. In fact, one of the, the meetings, one of the dialogues I had going with one of these toy companies went on for 21 months before I was finally rejected. So, uh, yeah, I really struggled to find a manufacturer to license it to in the early days. Wow. OK, that is in itself pretty intense what you're describing there. Now, Rob, I can see that we've already got a lot of questions coming through. Uh, so the Hub CP community is very eager to start to uh, throw, throw some questions. So before we get there, and I think when I was speaking to you uh, in, in preparation for this, what really amazed me is the amount of challenges that you have overcome. Would it be good just to give us a flavour for all the things that you have been faced with and had to overcome to get your, your business to where it is? Yeah, well, my, uh, my first year of business was, um, was slightly challenging. So uh, I had a manufacturer in China that went bust on me and we had to rush over uh, production to a new factory and try and make the Easter holidays of 2006. Uh, when that stock arrived, the, there was a teething problem and the catches kept popping open. Uh, so I had to fix all that inventory. And I took Trunky on Dragon's Den after two weeks of having stock. Uh, and I was told my business was worthless. Then I had to navigate the hand luggage ban of 2006. And, and this was the instance when we started having to put our, our liquids into plastic bags and have done ever since. But that happened. And you probably don't exactly remember the timing, but I do the start of the summer holidays of 2006 and the government banned hand luggage. The very product I just launched was banned from its fundamental use. So I had to navigate that one. Uh, and then when the Dragon's Den finally aired, the BBC called the episode really rubbish and I had to navigate that storm. So the first year was, was quite a challenge. We'll come on to overcoming some of those in a minute, but actually those challenges, although they sound insurmountable at the time, I've got a personal story that has, has made me quite resilient to these challenges because I was born with this condition, cystic fibrosis, and, yeah. and grew up on uh, a low fat diet, uh, couldn't eat any fat for the first eight years, never shared crisps or chocolate with friends. Um, and then I had a very vigorous routine of physiotherapy and lots of drugs uh, to try and keep my lungs as clear as possible. So I started life um, with my new nor my normal was just a big heavy routine of um, uh, medication and physio. But every time I tried to find self-pity, uh, my mother shot me down and said, there's always people worse off than you. Um, and that got me thinking more about uh, thinking in the here and now, not getting carried away about the future and trying to solve the particular issues I had every day. So uh, yeah, a big turning point in my life was when I was 16, I was born a twin. My twin sister, Kate, had cystic fibrosis too although she uh, struggled with it a lot more than I did. And sadly, she passed away to the disease in uh, when we were 16. So we kind of faced, and we, we go into this in the book and the first chapter, but faced with a similar fate and you weren't really expected to live much into your 20s with CF when I was born. Um, I knew my, my innings would be short and I, I thought, well, I can either wallow in self-pity and wait to succumb to this disease or I can... Uh, choose life and make the most of the short opportunity I have with it. So from then, I kind of really doubled down on finding my passion. And, and that was all around using my hands and creativity. I was dyslexic in school and stuck in special needs classes. So uh, I really found refuge in creativity and um, 
remember researching design when I was about 14, looking at the different careers and product design, which was a fairly new career back then, uh, really appealed to me. I caught the bug. And uh, as, as Sir Ken Robinson famously says, I found my element. And from the age of 14, I did absolutely everything I needed to do with laser focused determination to uh, get on the best course in the country, which was, was Northumbria. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's a bit of a back setting for my story. Because, you know, when you started by talking about those particular challenges, you know, a part of me is thinking, how do you overcome them? And was there, was there at any point where you just thought, oh, this is just ridiculous. I just, I've had enough of this. This is, this is clearly not meant to be. Or is it because of everything that you're talking about in terms of to overcome at, you know, such, a, such young ages? Is it just something's built into you, which is you will never, ever quit? Yeah, I, I, that I had a real strong belief that uh, the consumer really liked my products. I had lots of feedback from mums and kids. They loved the product. My challenge was uh, manufacturers didn't get it. Consumer, um, retailers didn't get it and investors didn't get it so that was that was just a, a long a long battle um, to try and get it to market um, but to overcome those challenges they didn't really seem insurmountable at the time they I kind of learned through overcoming quite a lot of adversity that challenges are finite they won't last forever although they can seem insurmountable uh, you just got to hold on and ride that storm but it's going to be hugely draining um, mentally to overcome those challenges. So uh, to me, it just made sense to focus on the problems I could solve and ignore everything else. So um, in 2006, when the hand luggage ban happened, I couldn't influence government on reversing their hand luggage ban, although I did try initially for a day on the phone. Um, and then um, I just suddenly realized, well, I've just got to focus on what I can control. And that was controlling costs. Uh, yeah. I was working out of my bedroom at the time because I didn't have an office. Um, I could pivot my marketing strategy to talk about staycations uh, rather than air travel. And I could look for the green shoots and where, where this hand luggage ban wasn't affected. <clears throat> and actually during this COVID crisis, it's been a very similar response. Um, we can't control when the government are easing lockdown, or it's great that they, they have just started. Um, so we've been controlling our costs. We acted very, very quickly to, um, to this, this storm. Uh, obviously, consumer goods, luggage is pretty much one of the worst affected. Um, but now, now with lockdown easing, our, our marketing strategy is pivoted to talking about visiting grandma, camping trips, staycations, uh, which you do need trunkies for, and um, looking for the green shoots. So Australia, um, Germany, other places where lockdowns are easing uh, better than ours. So yeah, that's kind of um, that's kind of one of the lessons I learned, I guess. Yeah, and I must sorry, just go back to something that when we spoke about the experience of Dragon's Den, and this for me really draws out where very savvy, very good entrepreneurs always find opportunity. So even when there is huge adversity, they always seem to find that that glimmer of light to pounce on and make something great. Now you knew that there was going to be a huge amount of people coming to your website on the back of that episode. What did you therefore do to seize the opportunity of that? <clears throat> yeah, well, let's just uh, a quick reminder, I guess, for people who don't remember the episode or, or who want to have a chuckle. Uh, I went in the den asking for £100,000 for 10% of my business and um, had a great product. It was totally unique. I had it in production. I had it in my feet and, and thought there couldn't be. I can't see how a, a dragon wouldn't want to invest in this. And, and actually, Richard Farley was my target because I knew he'd done some research. He had toddlers and I joked with him that he still needed to use a trunky even private, even while traveling on private jet. I towed him around the studio, pitch went perfectly until Trixie the pink trunky ended up at Theo's, Theo Petitus's feet. Maybe he was a bit jealous because he didn't get to be towed around the studio, but he was pulling a toe strap and popped it off. Uh, and at that point, we all lost our judgment. I really struggled to convince the dragons that it was such an easy problem to solve that, that strap hook could be made in stronger plastic overnight and it wouldn't be an issue um even though it towed an adult around the studio but the dragons just lambasted me kind of turned into this pack mentality and um yeah i had, I had peter jones saying he, did, he thought my business was worthless deborah didn't see the business opportunity uh duncan just didn't like the product and didn't like the business uh so they all went out richard farley saw a great opportunity he wanted to invest he wanted to give me the money for half my business 
there's no way I could give half away when I when I was after initially 10 percent. I'd have gone to 20, but not half. So I had to leave empty handed. I did actually leave empty handed because I sold Richard the two trunkies I took on the show. And a couple of months later, his wife sent me a check posted for Monaco. Uh, but times were hard. I wish I still had that check posted up somewhere, but no, I got <laughs> And then, and then there was a hiatus. There was like uh, four months before that episode aired, and I started exporting to America, to Australia, Japan. Started getting some traction in the UK market because at the time, none of the high street retailers would stock Trunky. It was just my website uh, and a couple of independent catalogs stocking it. Uh, so yeah, eager to know when I was going to be on uh, the telly. I kept going down to the local uh, news agents, picking up the Radio Times, trying to find out when I was going to be on. Uh, Tuesday night, BBC Two. Am I on? Am I not? Is there any hint? Uh, and one day I went there, on Tuesday night, BBC Two, wheelie rubbish. Uh, the colour drained from my face, uh, <clears throat> and I knew it was going to be it was going to be pretty bad. I knew that the next day I might not have a might not have a business. But as you said before, I, I kind of realised I was going to get some web traffic. Uh, I won't sell a single one, depending on how bad the editor is, but. I'll use it as an opportunity to get some valuable customer feedback to listen to my customers and see what they what they have to say. And and that night, over 2,000 people filled in phenomenal words of support on that survey. A consumer really got the product. There wasn't really any negative feedback, and I sold out. And it was a real kind of uh, epiphany that uh, all these years I've been like nine years up until that point I've been trying to get the product to market, and manufacturers, investors, and retailers just didn't get it, but the consumer did. And uh, for the next three years, we could not keep up with demand. Wow, that is awesome. Okay, I have got the flashing the flashing symbol questions coming in, uh, which is making me realise I've got to stop hogging this for a short while. So, Steve, who have we got, and what question would they like to ask? Um, hey guys, yeah, we, we do have a few questions in. Um, the first one is from Steve, and you, I think you covered this slightly, but uh, the first thing he wanted to say was that he loves your book. Um, and the second, his question is, how dependent is the success of Trunky on the ability for people to travel once more? Yeah, well, it's um, a tough time, and um, uh, having a very dynamic business that is one of our core values, we're, we're always open and looking to react to issues, and we saw the Italian lockdown on our Amazon rate of sale just drop off a cliff uh, and we knew that was the canary in the coal mine so we started reacting immediately to sh start stopping our marketing activity, stopping everything we could to, to conserve enough cash to, to see us through the storm. Uh, we're now seeing some great growth coming out of this and I think for us we're, we're a, a lifestyle brand that is a, a friend of the family that goes through all the adventures with the child over at least a five year period. So going to visit grandma, which is probably every family's first uh, first th thing to get in the car for when, after the 4th of July, um, that's a key occasion for us to celebrate and to hopefully encourage some more sales, but you may not be wanting to buy a new suitca a new adult suitcase to go and visit your parents. Um, so I think, I think we're gonna see um, a strong rebound um, international air travel yeah that looks like it is going to struggle for the next couple of years so but we've expanded our product range we don't just make the suitcases we make a whole range of children's travel gear well, our most popular product at the moment is our children's reins which we call toddle packs and they're reins to stop children running off in, and into the road and are proving highly effective at social distancing awesome um rob at the beginning i mentioned the fact that you are in your product is in over 100 countries. Is that something that right from day one you knew was going to happen or you set your stall for that to happen or is it a surprise? I mean, I'm just very interested for businesses that create, you know, products with such international reach. Is that a surprise or is that what you always set out to do? Yeah, so back back in the day, um, Trunky isn't patented, so you can't okay. protect the idea of a ride on suitcase. You can protect the way the clasps work or the wheels are fixed on, but that doesn't really give you much protection in the new category. So I didn't have a patent, so I knew I had to get this product out to market as quickly as possible, um, just to try and establish the brand as the original uh, and the best. So that's kind of what I did. And um, actually, uh, um, before I quit my job and before the first inventory arrived in the UK, I um, 
I was still working as a design consultant and my favorite design blog was uh, one called mocoloco.com. And I just thought, well, it'd be great if I posted a small press release about my product and maybe they'll cover it. And to my absolute delight, uh, Funky featured on my favorite design blog and I was a very happy chap, and so were my design peers. But I went home to um, a crazy web stats and a full inbox, and people all over the world had seen this post. Um, and the first email I opened was from uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, who wanted to buy 650 for their retail store. So that's how my international wow. exporting journey started. Okay, so um, Rob, we have got uh, some other great questions here. This one is a really good one. Um, would you ever consider being a dragon and if you did, would your approach be different to the current dragons? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't think I'll be a dragon, no. Uh, uh, I, I think in very early days, Dragon's Den had a bit of credibility as a business show, but that shoot, that shoot soon went out the window. Um, and I think the big problem with TV is you've got Dragon's Den and Apprentice that try and paint this picture about what an entrepreneur is. And there's as many people hopefully on this call are there's a much more humble less verbose entrepreneur out there that really just want to use their skills to improve the world around them uh, and not just shout at people and knock them down uh, and i think it's given a really bad name and it, i'm actually seeing that those effects i sit on the board at the university of west of england of their business school uh, and people just power when they hear that word entrepreneur and they don't see themselves as entrepreneurs because it's been tarnished with this very verbose business leadery type um, profile so uh, no I don't, don't think I support that but uh, but equally it is quite hard for the dragons because they haven't seen the business plan they haven't uh, got any research they're, they're, it, it literally has as it seems so you are hearing a new business from from scratch over that five minute pitch and have to make a decision so it is quite a tough environment to make an informed business decision in all fairness so um we get a lot of comments actually um we get a lot of inspirational story amazing story um we've got one person who just said uh, our second child has survived many travels around the world with their trunky so it's obviously a big hit with our crowd um and the next question is um it's said that grit is the only truly common attribute of successful people how did you get yours are there any techniques or mindsets uh, you uh, hold to, that help <clears throat> uh, I guess, um, well, deep down through growing up, I've always thought, well, life's short, so make the most of it. Um, so uh, that's one key fundamental driver. But actually, when I set the business up uh, and I took out a 10,000 personal loan, I quit my job, I just thought, well, look, this is going to be an educational experience. It might go well. All I really want to do is get my product on the shelves for people to buy. That's, that was my only goal back then. Um, so if it all goes a bit Pete Tong, you know, I'll have lost 10 grand and I'll get another job. So I didn't have, didn't feel like I had a huge amount to lose. Um, uh, but then, and then you're just so laser focused on trying to achieve your, your, your goal. And then after a, a year or so, that, that, that goal got lifted slightly higher to um, trying to become a global children's travel brand. Uh, uh, and that's quite a big goal for us. So we're, we've been running after that for a couple of years. And our greatest goal is um, is wanting trunkies to be used on trips to the moon. So that's kind of our our big hairy audacious goal we put out there. Wow, that's 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 a big ambition. I love that. Rob, let's just go back uh, a little bit to um, sort of a breakthrough moment and John Lewis. That pitch to them, which was ultimately very successful, and led to phenomenal sales. And I think this is really good advice for any. Body trying to get in front of retailers like John Lewis. How did you get in front of them and how did you win them over? Well, I've been knocked back by pretty much every buyer there from children's apparel, luggage, toy, baby, uh, and just going around in circles. So it was actually only after Dragon's Den aired uh, that a young uh, luggage buyer, Will, he took a phone call from me and, and thought, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's see what we can do here. And um, yeah, it was a great pitch. Um, it all went well, but actually when I went into John Lewis, I had the worst heartburn. Quite often people see I get really bad heartburn with the digestive system. So I felt like I was dying and I had to seek refuge in a, in a cubicle in the toilet and, and chuck my guts up and then I had to pull myself back together uh, and go and pitch to John Lewis. So uh, it was a great result. Uh, and, and actually I quite often find um, 
that uh, when you're going through some pretty dark stuff, uh, it doesn't get much worse, so it can only get better. Uh, and quite often you're quite surprised if you keep fighting, yeah. keep going, how much better things can get. Yeah. And that was interesting. You said you'd had numerous rejections, numerous rejections along the way. And I'm guessing oh, yeah. lots of people that were like, yeah, for, from uh, trying to pimp myself as a product designer, you get rejected a lot and it's just knocking on the door. Um, one of my tricks back in the day was, oh, my name's Rob Law, I'm a, a product designer, I've graduated with a first class degree and I've worked in New York and Taiwan. I'm just, just happened to be around the corner next week, is there any chance I could pop in? Now, I was up in Chester at my parents' house uh, and this was a London design agency, but if they said yes, I'll get a ticket, I'll get down to London, I'll make sure I was there next week to have an interview. And I used to do that all the time when I was in New York. I was knocking on every single design agency's door. Lots of rejection, but you just can't take it personally. You know, you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So you, get, you just got to keep making opportunities, and hopefully, sometime you'll get your break. So that's what I'm writing down here, Rob. Don't take it personally. Don't take it Don't personally take it because personally it's so easy. And try, try and stay as fresh and as in, as motivated for each one of those calls. Cool. Steve, back to back to you, please. Let's take another question. No worries. We just had a question from Abby um, about what would you call yourself if not an entrepreneur? Question, well, I would I would call myself an entrepreneur um, uh, or a business leader um, or an inventor or a product designer uh, or a marketeer. Um, I, I kind of just use the word trunky's daddy. Uh, that's my main title. But uh, <laughs> as as a business, yeah. Um, yeah, what, what, I, I kind of use the word entrepreneur. I prefer a business person, but um, but that's what the, the media really like to call you. I think yeah. think the key the key thing when I'm at the talking to students and, and talking about this particular category, it's about an enterprising mindset because not everyone can be let's call it an entrepreneur. And you talked about grit before. Not everyone's got massive grit to make a business succeed. Uh, but that's not a problem. Otherwise, there would be no jobs out there and everyone would be running their own businesses. So you've got to quickly realise whether you are that kind of person who wants to risk everything, uh, face lots of challenges and overcome them for potentially a prize at the end of the road. Or if you prefer um, not to do that, then then work for someone. Um, and there's not, no right or wrong. Uh, one, one of the key mantras I've got is there's, there's no right and wrong. There's just ways that work, ways that don't. Um, and you just got to find your way through these things. Yeah. Rob, when we've um, we've spoken about some of the things that really help to differentiate your business, we know that the product is truly distinctive. And that obviously is always a great way to create any brand. But you also mentioned the customer experience and how important that is to you and how you put that right at the center of everything that your, your business does. What is it that helps you to create such a great customer experience? Well, I think I, I realized the power of good customer service when I failed miserably to get a design job in Sydney and ended up in American Express's call center trying to earn enough money to get a few uh, beers at the end of the week. And <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, there I was just trying to solve problems and take very personal insults. And people thought I was a shareholder in Amex the way they treat me. But, uh, but that, there's the problem solving mindset of trying to solve people's problems. And actually the power of having a happy customer at the end of that call really kind of was quite surprising. So in the early days of Trunky, when I had what I call the, the Trunky sneezes, so the first batch of Trunkies, quite often the catches will pop open when a child sat on top of the Trunky. And, and I had to deal with quite a few irate phone calls. So I'd, I'd try and win the customer over with a bit of humor, say, oh, it sounds like your Trunky's caught a cold. They must have got the sneezes on the high sea, but fear not, I will solve this problem for you. Uh, and you've got to think back sort of 14, 15 years ago, customer service just wasn't a key focus of any business. And you kind of phone someone up expecting to have a fight. And then more recently at times that that's now turned around. But having a happy customer is so important um, from a marketing point of view. There's no point in investing in marketing if you don't have happy customers. Uh, now with the power of social media, anyone can spread bad words about your brand. So invest first and foremost in making sure your customers are happy, keep them happy, and then try and leverage that happiness to convert them into brand advocates. And and then then, then they can help sh share the word. So is your advice therefore to always add a bit of humor, uh, if you can, to try and make it personal, friendly, and, well, and take the sting out? 
it's different for different people works for us um yeah. i mean your your customer service might be about quality so you you try and push quality in every touch point you've got um with them uh, it, it all depends on on the business i mean i was hugely inspired by the innocent skies back in the day because they were quite pioneering at the time um they had funky job titles and used a bit of humor on their packaging uh and that that was a similar voice that we had too so um yeah we had miss money penny sales sheriffs uh intergalactic ambassadors working for us and um yeah we always try to have a bit of fun and humor i mean fun for us is one of our core business values along with being dynamic being responsible and innovation uh, so that's what works for us it doesn't work for everyone cool steve i can see there's more questions Oh, it is going off the wall here for questions. I'm struggling to listen to you and type answers back to people. It's fantastic. Um, but one of the questions from Patrick is, Rob has obvious design skills. Where did you pick up your business skills? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I didn't do business studies. I had no business uh, real skills. Uh, and my first experience of getting some support was with the Prince's Trust back in 2002. So I qualified for their enterprise program and I got a great guy, Philip, who was my mentor, uh, who taught me the value of business planning, cash flow forecasts, how an elevator pitch could really cons consolidate down your message into a 30 seconds. Um, and a couple of these key skills that I picked up. Um, and then, um, I mean, at the end of the day, business is just common sense um, and problem solving and problem solving something I innately can do. Um, but I was always asking when I was doing various things, is this because you're told to do things certain ways? Is that the best way of doing something? Is there a better way of doing it? Uh, and really trying to embrace more progressive ways of doing stuff. So, um, so yeah, like appraisals, for instance, appraisals, everyone hates doing them uh, or certainly managers do. But actually, it's such a powerful tool for the employee to share their thoughts. Uh, an appraisal should be more of a listening um, exercise, where ideally, if you can only say three words in an appraisal as a line manager, you've done a phenomenal job because it's all about giving your your um, employee team member uh, a platform. So, yeah, when it came to appraisals, you had all these HR legislation and things, the ways you should do things. And I was just like, three questions. What's going well? What's not going well? And what are we going to do to improve it? Um, that's the appraisal and that can last two hours and if I can get away with just asking those two questions then it's a very good appraisal. Comes back to what you were saying earlier about laser focus. I mean that for yeah. me feels a very focused approach to do anything and again I think that's a real lesson in itself, complete and utter focus on the job in hand. Um, so Steve you said more questions, next question. We have uh, we have got those questions and I have an opportunity to put two of them together. Um, nice. Mel, Mel has asked, um, what is your favorite trunky and why? And Steve has asked, what's your favorite, let me get this right, um, what's your favorite piece of product design ever? So that's your favorite trunky and why, and your favorite ever design of anything and why? Okay, so uh, favorite trunky, uh, I'm going to upset a lot of trunkies here, so I'm going to choose two. Uh, the favourite one's got to be Terence, the original blue one. Um, uh, uh, he's been on many adventures with me, but but actually I'm I'm just so proud that uh, we haven't changed any of the original Trunky's colours in the 14 years we've been trading, and they still look just as vibrant and fresh. That's that's probably why I like Terence the most. Uh, and Sky here, the spaceship Trunky who glows in the dark, has a very poignant um, adventure with me at the the end of my book. I'm also a big fan of space travel. That's the ultimate form of, of travel, really. Uh, and not being able to be an astronaut because of my physical health condition, uh, I've always kind of dreamed of that. So sky is quite special to me too. Favorite piece of product design? Wow, um, that is a tough one. Um, I, I mean, I, I really like, I really, really like things that can revolutionize the way we've done things in the past. Um, and I guess something that seems so simple today, the iPhone, um, how that revolutionized the way we communicate uh, and how it brought the internet to everyone's hands, I think as a piece of innovation, not just the product design, but the whole product, the, the, the ecosystem Apple created to control that product, uh, it's just a huge piece of innovation um, and has made, made so many things possible like Facebook, Instagram, 
Twitter wouldn't have come about if it wasn't the iPhone. So I think that's a pretty huge innovation. Yeah, absolutely. Rob, in terms of countries um, and exporting, can I just ask for your tips in terms of where do you begin to start to make your product go global? It's something obviously that with such low barriers to entry now that many businesses want to do, but many struggle. Is there anything that you can really give us that, that bit of that beautiful bit of you know nugget insight? Yeah, so my my initial approach was very scattergun and trying to grasp every opportunity. And I, I realized a bit later on in my business journey that we're spending just as much time dealing with one customer in a very small market as we were in a, with another customer in a massive market. So then we decided to segregate our, our customers into strategic markets. They might be really big markets, but might take a few years to really penetrate. So the likes of China, Germany, France, the USA, they're our strategic markets. Then we've got our important markets, uh, ones where we then want to spend our next amount of time. So an important market uh, might be somewhere like um, uh, even somewhere like Norway, um, because they're, they're, they've actually, our distributor there has sold a, a lot of trunkies considering the population size. So it's not a very big opportunity long term, but it's easy fruit. Uh, and then put a couple, the bulk of them in that kind of in, important market. And then you've got your maintenance markets, ones where you just don't have the bandwidth to ever get much traction in or the market's just too small and you don't really know where to start and you haven't got the bandwidth. So that might be um, somewhere like Brazil or India or, or places that really require a lot more time and effort to penetrate. Um, so yeah, segmenting those and then allocating time accordingly. Um, and then ease to export now. I mean, I started 14 years ago, but Amazon now for consumer product make it incredibly easy for you to get across the whole of Europe into the US, into a number of other countries and e-commerce. If you've got an e-commerce consumer product, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, but you've got to, if you're trying to get that product into the market directly, then you have to invest in the marketing directly. So if you want to put it out there, you've got to really drive awareness. And that's where something like the Amazon platform is quite interesting. Um, and then services uh, is a whole different ball game. But you've also got to, you've got to kind of assess the cultural reference references and significance for your product you've got to look at safety standards if, if that's relevant for your product and and standards in general and then you've got to consider ip as well so it's quite a big quite a big thing to get your head around so just segment it into different different segments intellectual property standards uh culture um, routes to market try and break it down uh, and make assessments on each country according to things like that and I'll quickly ask the US, where would you put that in terms of your category, in terms of, is it, is it the ultimate? Is it something oh, that you have? i my battle scars from the US. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of always say the US and many businesses have gone over there and failed. And uh, yeah, I've had a, uh, I licensed Trunky to a big toy company for a few years, but they didn't market it. So the sales didn't go where we wanted them to. So we pulled that back. Um, we've tried and failed a number of different things. One, at one point, I remember looking at a business plan where we weren't going to make money for four years. It was like, nope, we're not going to do that. We've got to start turning a profit within a year of, uh, of of getting out there. So we, we've always jiggled and iterated our plan in the US. And actually now it's just um, an Amazon only plan. Um, uh, and it's very profitable for us. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Steve, next question, please, sir. OK, so we have a question here from Andrew. He's asked. What mistake have you learned the most from? Brilliant question from Andrew. Yes, that's a good one. Um, see, the problem with mistakes is you learn from them. Uh, uh, and a mistake or a failure is a great opportunity to learn and develop. Um, so I have no regrets over the mistakes I've made, if you can call them that, or the failures. Um, because that, that's what truly makes us human. I think success is just the hiatus in a series of defeats. Uh, and when we face a defeat or um, a mistake, then we learn from it and we pivot and we move forward. And, and then maybe in a few years time, if you hadn't made that mistake earlier, it might be a much greater mistake in the future. So um, there's gonna be loads of mistakes I made uh, or, or ways that didn't work, as I prefer to call them. Um, but I have no regrets. Sounds like you, sounds like you need to write a song about that. <laughs> um, 
I mean, right. you could say uh, we had a, a massive legal battle with, uh, as an example, we had a, a massive legal battle around a copycat product. Um, we, we've had lots of copies over the years and we managed to shut them down. But this particular one uh, was from a British company, so it's not home turf. Uh, it's clearly a copy, infringed my registered design rights. Uh, and we got um, a European injunction and took it to the High Court and we won. So, hooray, great. This is a chapter in the book, by the way. Uh, uh, but they appealed on technicality and we lost. And all of a sudden I was faced with uh, the other side's legal costs. They were suing me for lack of sale, for uh, loss of sales because of the injunction. And that just felt deeply unjust. So um, I took a rallying cry. I called on um, some very big um, pro uh, designer celebrities like Sir Terence Conran, Kevin MacLeod, Paul Smith. And we got a great article in the Telegraph and we started championing uh, that this had such great importance uh, that we should have our hearing in the Supreme Court. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. We had the Intellectual Property Office standing up on our side, telling these five most senior judges in the whole land that the ramifications of the decision were so great they should defer it to Europe, where Europe's a lot more favourable on designers' rights. Um, but we lost. It was it was not overturned. And uh, yeah, the day after we lost, and there was nothing more I could do. You know, I was at the end of the road. There were no other courts I could take it to. Uh, and I did wallow in self pity for a day or two, um, but realised I started slipping down a slope. Pulled myself back. There's nothing else I can do. All I can do is forget, put it in the past, and focus on the future. And sometimes you've got to really uh, recognise when you've lost a, a battle and, and it's time to move on. However, I did have a bit of a win because throughout that whole time, I was shouting from the rooftops with the press. The press never had really covered brands being copied before because it's, it's like the brand's dirty laundry. So uh, we got a huge amount of column inches, loads of photos. Uh, and the day the judge handed down the judgment against us, we were in every single national newspaper and TV network with brilliant photos of trunkies being used to take kids off exploring the world. Uh, and, and the headline was not only have we lost, but it has a huge damaging significance to the uh, design um, community in the UK. Uh, so we were able to spin that title. Over that three year period, we made more sales year on year on year. And the product that we took all the way to the court has completely removed it from market because it's been a, an absolute flop. So was that the right thing to do? <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> Another great No. Uh, oh. Yeah, another great example, though, for me, of just the opportunity that you always seem to scoop out of adversity. And I think because you just never take it personally. And I think that's something I'm, I personally really want to learn from this. It's just if you don't well, take you it do, personally. I mean, you sometimes take it personally and, and, and you have to really think, uh, try and have to get your mind past that and yeah. um, uh, and to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve, I've got another question, but I just want to gauge where we are with questions with the audience. So over to you if we have another one. Okay, yeah, I'd love to ask this one. Uh, this is from Abby as well. She said, can you say more about wanting to improve the world with your products? Say that again? Uh, can you say more about wanting to improve the world with your products? Well, back for us, our value earlier. cry is not that we make plastic luggage for kids. We make products that enable parents and carers to take their kids off exploring the world, which is a, a hugely educational experience experiencing new cultures, new foods, and hopefully by getting kids off exploring more, uh, they become less bigoted and see the big picture and can grow a lot more as individuals. Uh, but that's not just about holiday, our products also for every day and just getting the kids out and about in the great outdoors with our swimming bags or our backpacks or a whole range of other products we, we do. So that's kind of part of our rallying cry. Um, but one of the key things that I think we've done that I'm very proud of is reshoring production from China. So our suitcases are made in Plymouth. Um, we had a big reshoring project back in 2012 because uh, you know, there are lots of challenges with dealing with China, lead times, exchange rate fluctuations, um, a whole host of problems, communication. And, and I really wanted to bring production back to the UK and found a factory that could make it for a really good price. Um, and that allowed us to innovate too. Um, but also it really resonated with our core values about responsibility and, and having products manufactured in China with dirty energy from coal power fire stations and then shipped on the most polluting vehicles halfway across the world, containers, uh, shipping containers to, to the UK and then sent to a distribution centre that's then sent to the retailers to then sent to 
um, then mum drives into town and buys the product. I mean, it's just a huge carbon footprint, pretty much every consumer product has. Um, so we really wanted to manufacture in Plymouth, stored next door in our own warehousing, and then sent directly out to mum using DPD or Royal Mail, whoever, um, through our e-commerce channels. So yeah, really proud we've managed to massively shorten down that supply chain uh, and, and reduce a, a huge part of our carbon footprint. Just on that, I mean, I, I often get asked, well, you make plastic products and this whole thing about plastic at the moment. The thing about plastic at the moment is single use plastic. It's not about plastic products that are used every day, day in, day out for multiple years. It's about the ones you use once and throw away and they end up in the, the ocean. I haven't once yet seen a, a picture of a trunky floating in the ocean that what didn't have a child hanging onto it. Um, uh, but, but yeah, our big question is, should we be not using plastic and be using something that's biodegradable? And the challenge there is um, it won't last as long. You can use um, corn, corn and rice um, resins and things like that to create products, but they're very brittle and they smash. The first step on any sustainability journey should be reuse. It takes a lot of energy to create a product. You've got to reuse it for as long as you can. So Trunkies have a five year guarantee. They last for about a five year journey from a child from two to seven. Um, and then they should be used as childhood memory boxes to keep all those memories in instead of a shoe box. So they, they have a, an infinite lifespan in my eyes. Um, uh, so reuse it. And then if you if your child outgrows it, they, there's a huge market on eBay for them and Facebook Marketplace. So the trunkies actually have an incredibly long life cycle. Uh, and if we used a, a different plastic that was biodegradable, they wouldn't have that long life cycle uh, and they break um, much sooner. So our choice has been to use uh, the most the best plastic we can to make it as long and as durable as possible. So that initial manufacturing input of energy and carbon can last the longest amount of time. And then at the end of the product's life, it can be fully recycled. So the, the trunkies are 100 percent plastic. There's no metal in them. They're very easy to recycle at your local recycling center. So after reusing, recycle. That's the next step. And if you made it out of a biodegradable plastic, you wouldn't be able to recycle it. Long rant. Did that make sense? It's a perfect long rant. I'm sorry to jump. John, I'm sorry to jump in. I just want that rant was so good, it answered a few of our questions, which is brilliant. Um, because we had a question about what was your um your decision on where to um build the trunky and you know what helped you come to that decision. So of course lowering your carbon footprint was the answer and you've you produce it in one country which is fantastic so um yeah that's great so sorry to jump in john but we're still making china for southeast asia because shipping product back over there obviously reverses that carbon footprint saving so we still have some manufacturing in china for the local markets but uh the whole of europe and russia and the lights raw and the us is all supplied out of the uk okay great thanks rob um rob you're an mbe and uh, this is the first time I've interviewed an MBA, which is really cool. So huge congratulations on that. Was it a surprise? Talk us through the uh, the moment that you were told you were an MBA. Yeah, it was a surprise, but there's a, a bit of a backstory to it. So I was on my first holiday five years after starting the business, first proper holiday anyway. It was a two week trip to Cuba. Uh, and a couple of days in, uh, I got a, it was really bad to get Wi-Fi and signal over there. Uh, so it was actually a great holiday to just shut off for a bit. Uh, but then I had this um, voicemail from the government uh, and I couldn't quite pick it up. Um, couldn't quite hear what they were saying. I had an email um, uh, that I couldn't get hold of. Um, so I was really wondering what on earth was going on. Why are the government trying to get hold of me? You know, I kind of, I do pay my taxes. I don't think I've, I've forgotten to do something here. Uh, and when I finally did get hold of the message, it was, um, I'm asking whether I'd be uh, open to receiving an MBE for services to business. So that's quite a nice surprise. Um, but my initial reaction was, well, I didn't really deserve this, um, but at least it'll be a nice day out for the parents. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it'd been, it must be quite nerve wracking being in Cuba, having the British government trying to contact you. I'm, I'm sure that probably got the stomach acid a bit high in terms of <laughs> what's going on here. Well, slightly, slightly more nervous was, was meeting the Queen because I had a little PR stunt. I dressed Tipu the uh, tiger trunky up in, a, in an orange fur jacket with a white front. Uh, so I disguised him as a corgi and I took this coyly round. It was Windsor Castle rather than Buckingham Palace. Windsor Castle. And I was thinking, should I really present this to the Queen? 
probably not very uh, the right kind of etiquette. Actually, no, I'll probably get shot, so I, I won't. So yeah, uh, I decided not to present this to the Queen. But later on that afternoon, we were walking around uh, the grounds of Windsor Castle, and we saw I saw the Queen's dog walker in the distance. So ran after her with my corgi trunky, and we got some great photos of a, a real Queen's corgi sniffing the bum of uh, my corgi. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, I'm conscious, Rob, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to see if Steve can uh, do a great job of amalgamating any more questions into one. Steve, is that possible? Because I'm sure we've got some few well, more. Um, we have got a stack of questions. So what I'd like to um, say is that we will uh, get all of these questions answered, um, if that's all right. I know that we, uh, we're going to pinch Rob for a little bit more time and we'll produce a really nice um, doc to send to everybody to say, here's all the answers to questions we couldn't answer. Uh, but in the meantime, this uh, for the final one from us, can you ever see yourself letting go um, and looking on at others? Can, so I guess it is, what do you want your legacy to be? So do you think you're ever going to let it go? Um, and that's from Damien. Well, um, a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago, my business coach said, uh, what are you doing this all for, Rob? Um, what's it all about? And, and I've been so close to the cold face of trying to make Trunky success everything else had gone out of the, my perspective. I just hadn't really thought. Uh, and, and she had to quiz me a few times on this and it suddenly occurred to me that um, I wanted to start a family. And that's something that is a bit difficult to do when you've got cystic fibrosis because um, technically it's not possible. So, um, so that really got me thinking about the long term and actually thinking about the future. So in the book, we talk about my, my journey using IVF to, to try and start a family and now, uh, eventually become successful and um, with my partner Catherine we've now got three beautiful children uh, and part of that was I wanted to spend some time with those kids so I actually will only work three days a week have done for the last four years um, so three days a week in the business and two days outside to, to really be there with my kids and enjoy family life and also to explore other opportunities like um, writing my book don't forget to buy the book uh, and um, yeah, that's been uh, that's been really rewarding, and and I think a lot of people are experiencing this in COVID. Uh, I've been doing it for the last couple of years, and um, yeah, it's it's hugely enriching and rewarding. Just losing yourself in, in the kids uh, in the kids' imagination. Great, Steve. One more question. Okay, so um, actually, we're just getting loads of comments in. Oh, look, amazing stories, so inspiring. Love the story. It's just. I can't get them all onto the screen. So thank you everybody who's putting all these great comments on. Um, I've been just trying to get the questions to come over. Um, so we had uh, one question about, when you spoke earlier about having 10,000 pounds, and if you only lost that 10,000 pounds, it would be all you'd lose. So one of the questions we had was, well, how much is too much capital? You see people gone the den with invested half a million pounds, but you know, how much do you think of is too much capital? That's a good question. I mean, uh, I kind of had to find out the hard way how to run a business on the shoestring, as many of us have. Uh, and I think that was a valuable lesson. Yeah, maybe if 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 I had got an investment in the den, I wouldn't have learned one of the, the fundamental skills you need as a businessman uh, is to how to make money go a very long way um, uh, and to try and do absolutely everything on the shoestring. So that teaches you a huge amount about uh, how to get the biggest bang for your buck. So, yeah, I don't know. It's... Um, and quite often now with software, you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G rounds, don't you? And get millions and millions and millions and never make any money. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that's just seems completely alien to me, although I get the, the basics of it. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, it, it's a tough question. I don't think there's any any right answer here, but um, I think you'd be surprised at how much you can do when you've got no money or little money and how to make it go a long way. I mean, even today, we don't really spend much on marketing because we've got a product that people love and talk about and review on Amazon. We've got over 10,000 reviews across all of Amazon platforms, um, averaging about 4.6 stars. So um, wow. yeah, embracing that kind of customer satisfaction point again, doesn't really cost you much as long as you've got a good product and you've invested in that product. Um, so yeah, just, just try and, think about really where where you do need to invest and spend yeah we're going to stop the questions uh, there steve this um rob this has been really really cool to hear your story you know something that strikes me about everything you've said is it feels 
like do you get a kick out of the find the odds is that something that you would agree with it feels to me that every time something rears itself as a challenge it's almost something that you enjoy would that be fair to say ah uh, that's an uh, that's interesting observation uh no i still go through that initial emotional turmoil of uh, oh my god this is going to be a steep drop or a big uh, a big challenge but then i quickly i think i think to sum up this the skills i use are um to realize whatever this challenge is going to be it's going to be finite so i've just got to hold on there will be another side and quite often on the other side there are opportunities so to get through that storm i need to be use my energy very wisely uh, and my headspace so i've got to focus on the things i can control and try and forget about everything else uh, so yeah. cystic fibrosis, I can't control when there'll be a cure. All I can do is be as healthy as I can for as long as I can. COVID, uh, we've talked about that before. Um, yeah, I can't influence when lockdown's going to be released, but I can control costs and talk differently about the marketing of my product. Um, so yeah, uh, use that energy wisely um, and then look for these opportunities. And, and we're, we're on this journey through life and it's not a straight line from A to B. Um, yeah. It's a very wiggly line that gets you to maybe C. So don't see uh, failure as a terminal blockage to progress. Yeah. Kind of see it as an opportunity to try something differently. And you might be have got into a challenge going from A to B, but you end out at C. But actually, C is a success, uh, and yeah. it's a whole different direction you can travel in. Brilliant, Rob. That is such a great summary, and I just want to thank you on behalf of, of myself, PP, everybody that has been listening today. Thank you so much for doing the live lounge with us today. Really appreciate it. It's been really inspirational. Um, and we will all be buying 65 roses in a trunky to find the odds in life and business. Okay, so get on. We need to drive the Amazon ranking so it gets up. <laughs> up thanks, thanks, thanks enormous, Rob. It's been it's been it's been it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, now, just to let everybody know, we will be doing a podcast. This will be going out on 2nd of July. And by signing up for that podcast, you will get the opportunity to get a signed copy yes you heard that correctly a signed copy from the great man himself um so second of july this will be uh, a podcast going out there so please do sure to sign up be sure to sign up details of that will follow from here right what have we got next 16th of july we have got kat augustino and jay richards from imogen uh, jay is a forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur an incredible achievement for anybody that gets recognized in that Forbes list, that's for sure. And these guys understand just what businesses need to do to be appealing, attractive to Gen Z. So Gen Z, that is basically anybody born between 1995 and 2015. Millennials, they're yesterday's news, guys. This is all now about Gen Z because they are young and there's a lot of them. And in terms of selling your products and uh, attracting them to join your businesses, it's really important that we all know exactly what makes these guys tick and how we make our businesses appealing to them in terms of our culture and also our products. So join us July the 16th for Jay and Kat, who will be telling us exactly what needs to be done to achieve success with Gen Z. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next live lounge later in July. Enjoy the sun. See you soon.